I didn't know what to do in Sydney. I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was like, if I'm going to be confused, I might as well be confused with the job. And then this like 50 year old guy shows up, like cowboy boots, smack, cowboy hat, leather jacket, and Sydney, and he throw daddy book at the daddy book. I'm like, huh? You were on a trek, and then I figured you're always on like a trek, like on Sydney. Yeah. And bro. then I figured your whole family is always on a trek. Uh, we all have a very strong relationship with like mountains and nature like since we were very young it's been ingrained on us dalbat ma tu en tago dali frima he brought jagge i'm like so like i was like the nepali le motro go se esto i've had it way easier than 99% of artists that try to make it here bro i walked to my guitar eh like and go they ah man you know what they're about what they're about when they don't say ni 13 year old girls formed a ring around me ke bro hate siri samate re and they escorted me out day eh? it's not enough to just make music anymore ke okay? there's only so much that the music will do for itself ke okay? there's like a lot that you have to do for it as well hi everyone i'm kritisha and i am aditya and welcome to tiki channel the podcast this is episode 49 and this is our in conversation series Uh, for people who don't know in conversation series mate we have a conversation with interesting people and we get to know why they are the way they are so with us we have a well known influencer <laughs> and he is <laughs> mostly known for his music and his witty contents on tiktok so wang then welcome welcome to tiki channel podcast yeah hello thank you so much for having me How do you feel? This is um I don't know. Your second podcast? Yeah, this is my second podcast. Uh I feel good. I hmm, well apprehensive but I'm excited but but I'm not to see where this mm-hmm. where this takes us. Right. Yeah, we, we we were like super excited to have you over to and it like bolla bolla time milanda milanda reschedule that was so complicated. Here. This is nice. So uh as mentioned Agi like this um episode or this series is all about mm-hmm. getting to know you so tell us about we'll yourself we'll also do some catching up mm-hmm. yeah um hello everyone my name is wanglin sherpa um i'm a content creator of an artist um those are usually the two hats that i wear um i've been making music for about this day a year a year two years now and i've been creating content for about the same time um that's pretty much it i think we'll get to explore uh, more as we go on but i'm not mm. so are what like, are you, are you about you? using the word influencer just a quick question um, i mean i think it's like it's tough because every time you use the word influencer in nepal it's like people hate it eh? people hate that word um and i myself don't really love it too much i know i think i see myself more as a content creator because i mean what i do on tiktok is i don't really lean too much into the doing ads and monthly pushing products and all that stuff i just like all i want to do is i want to make people laugh and give have make people have a good time so i think i personally say i align more with content creator than i do with influencer but i don't hate the tag but i i don't think it deserves the hate that it gets ke especially any time mm. on TikTok when you say influencer people hate that but I don't think that's warranted that preferred align with content creator. Yeah. I think it's also a technical term cuz like uh, especially marketing world me one like by the tier it's like 10k followers boy when it's you're like a micro influencer Nepal my friend it's 3k I don't know the technical so <laughs> I don't know that line, you're like a micro influencer you mm. uh, creed dropping some marketing terms on us so. data <laughs> and technicalities just like technical you think is it tricky on insta or tiktok instagram instagram mm. tiktok mata i think it's way more than that yeah i feel like tiktok is so much easier to get followers where you kind yeah, of have to be yeah, Tik- tiktok is a whole different ball game man yeah it's as so long as you're making content i think it's like very reachable like the more people like you you just like go everywhere mm. yeah I'm so sorry, it's I so unpredictable though i'll say You know, it, it often happens because I mean, say it's been a while since we've done a podcast together. So obviously, we're also like your online format. No, God, I think it's a you only get the cut off for it. It's a only only answer. But obviously, as mm. we go through the podcast, like gonna be all right. 
I wanted to start with like growing up and I had an interesting question I think because I listened to your previous podcast and like yeah it's a majority could out of my soul the one I could out it's a you've already answered this I don't want to repeat the same questions again you know but one thing I wanted to know say like what was the kind of music you were growing up on like what kind of music influenced you in my favorite genre or your favorite artist or do Mm, I think it's like we all grew up listening to the same when suddenly like here without you when an all day down day like that's like so classic yeah I'm ruined suddenly um uh-huh. but I grew up on a lot of John Mayer um I think John Mayer was kind of the artist that like molded me in terms of like I think these days I listen to him a lot less. I've become a little bit more um, R&B and a little bit into different different genres. So growing up so I felt like I really I used to sing, I used to play guitar and so if you're like a young boy in the 2000s who's singing and playing guitar, I feel like there's really not many people that you would turn to um instead of John Mayer. So I really grew up listening to I feel like that's like the artist that kind of defined my a child at key and still now like if I, every time i pick up a guitar ni like the first songs that i usually my heart be not go else like like unzani just like your body's a wonderland or who says or slow dancing like that, those are just the songs that i'll never forget key like they're etched into my fingers key like i'll learn other songs every now and then but if i pick up a guitar even when i'm 80 key, i know I'll, i'll always be able to play who says and yeah the bonny bit ke dimag mein geet aur aa hi rahe ga Obviously. Yeah, I feel like when say 2000s ago, I feel like John Mayer was inevitable. Okay, everyone yep. once he aspired to play like him, to to write like him. I guess in some ways, write like him. That yeah. This is under. Um, I mean, I've been singing for a while, like 11, 12. With that, I guess I was like, not necessarily like, oh, I'm a singer one too, but it was more just like, mm-hmm. oh, I guess I have a, a nice enough voice and people enjoy listening. So this that was 11 12 when I started singing and about 13 when I picked up the guitar for the first time. Okay. So it's been a while. It's been a while since I started playing. Mm. And you, when was uh when you first composed a song? What was the song? That's kind of a tough question because like I've been writing fragments of songs for a long time. When Sunny I've mm-hmm. been writing like a verse here and there. I'll just pull up my my uh guitar and write a verse here and there. Thought uh, seriously when I wrote and completed my first ever song was 2020. Yeah, 2020 was when I wrote my first ever song. Yeah. And, like I had it like complete from any verse, the key chorus, like everything mm-hmm. was done and I could show it to people as a full song. Like that's the first time mm-hmm. I ever wrote a song, 2020. Lockdown oh, Bella. Like, was that the reason why you started getting into music? Because you said like high school man you weren't really into I mean, you didn't want to be that singer-songwriter. Yeah, it's still. I mean, growing up, I never ever thought when Sunny, oh, I'll write songs, I'll put out music. When Sunny, that was never really a thing that I aspired to. But uh, mm-hmm. it was always something that interested me, right? Like I always knew that I liked singing, I liked performing, and so that's always an as- aspect of my life that I knew was always fulfilling. And then during lockdown, I was just like at my at home with nothing to do, and Sunny. And um I felt like I'd been putting off this songwriting thing forever okay and I was always like oh I'm too busy I leave you to it you to that I will lock down my king no one okay we have nothing to do and I couldn't I had no more excuses okay I kind of ran out of everything and a big thing that pushed me was I like imagine myself at 50 okay just looking back at life and suddenly being like damn When I was 24, yeah, if I had just written a song and put it out and suddenly like not necessarily gone to the studio and recorded a full length album that if I just came mula ale matra be yaar ki unte wala yaar but I saw myself so vividly saying that and living that life ke and I was like this is a go no boy bro so I was like okay I'll write something just to see you and suddenly but I always in the back of my mind I was like is to get the jolin like the as like you know you hear songs on the radio like you hear I don't know. I'm not gonna name any artists, but you're like, yeah, yeah, it's the job of doing like the arts. And so I was like, okay, now it's time to time to prove that Hunzani. That's not just bullshit, Vanilla. So, yeah, that's the first time I wrote a song was 2020. And which was the first song that you wrote? Lavender Lemonade. I don't oh, know if you guys have heard it. Damn. Of course, yeah. bro. Of course. Yeah, that's the first song. So I just gone back from a road trip, okay? During lockdown, uh-huh. I taken a road trip to Colorado because I used to live in Texas. Ani, there was just a moment on the trip, okay? It was like 
driving on sunny to highway ma and we're driving to the desert there's nothing pahardo it's a distance ma in the distant distant horizon you can see like pahardo and the sky's pink and we're just driving it was just the most like serene moment okay and i i remember being in that moment and like thinking okay like i need to capture this somehow and so like i need to bottle this up so that i can just come back to it whenever i need to and so when i came back from that road trip um i like ordered you sasto mic like this is a nice mic i ordered like a cheap mic on amazon eh? and then i had my uh macbook air and i had the free software and sunny a garage band on it and so mm. i just started playing around my guitar and then i came up with that first line that windows down the sun is up and then from then on i just was like i could picture everything so clearly okay? and so i just mm. recorded the first part and then i just kept building on it and that song kind of was the first song that i ever was like i'll but say it's complete okay when sunny like leaky so down to the usually no 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 um it was a lot of iterations because that song bro that song initially was called like Tacoma or something it was Tacoma. so different okay uh it was it was like um the sweet aroma of Tacoma yeah da, 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 da. it's mm-hmm. just like that song went through multiple iterations before it became mm-hmm. what it was and it actually it wasn't called lavender lemonade for the longest time it was just called like untitled okay it was just called like mm-hmm. windows down or something and then i was in the studio with my producers and they were like okay bro i would say you have to name the song because we're already here and since recorded by sege of the minisuke danso we have to name the song something and then i remember that on the road trip say we had stopped by this really small like cafe in west texas in the middle of nowhere okay? and their specialty drink was lavender lemonade and mm. i remember <clears> just <throat> as soon as that memory came to my mind i was like ah oh, that's the name of the song it's in the lavender lemonade okay that's what i'm gonna call it and i feel like it fits the vibe of the song so well so yeah that was just like like it just i feel like the song kind of found itself okay i just tried to help it along the song really is like of the vibe okay like the first time i i think like there was a few times that before i discovered like the music and there was a few mm. times i just like heard a few clips from tiktok you know mm. and that was my first introduction and obviously like mutual friends are but i'll see you around it out yeah. the man said was yeah. and then i was like i man who's this guy like it's a ne git in but then i go to like spotify and i listen to the entire like everything you've got like every single song yeah. on repeat ke mero mero the spotify your rap ma you're like on the third or fourth ke That's and where I should that be, bro. Uh, Next year I'm second. Next year I'm coming for that second. <laughs> and I, I think like the lavender lemonade has really stood out to me, okay? Yeah. Because because there are a lot of musicians who try really hard to like bring out that vibe or like you know to get to a certain like get you in a certain place, okay? Because yeah. some some musics do that to you, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. But that that song was like so natural. I think like all of your songs like it comes very natural, okay? Yeah, I think and for me it's just the way that song came about me it was such a it was such an organic moment okay? and mm. my intentions with the song I feel like I, I don't want to say pure but my intentions when I wrote the song were so like pure in the sense that like when I wrote the song all I wanted to do was just capture that moment okay? I didn't want to mm. put out an album I didn't want to and suddenly be famous or put mm. me I just wanted mm. to capture the essence of that moment and so i think that's what kind of lends itself into the honesty that you hear okay? because it's just mm-hmm. like me just trying to um put into unsani words and music just like how i felt in that moment and that's more like the like, of time in in different artists there is like different qualities okay and there's like some artists who do storytelling really really well if you mm-hmm. listen to billy joel like if you listen to Elton John like una go geeta you can just like listen to them and like with the lyrics itself it paints you an entire picture of the like all the scene that's happening okay? mm-hmm. and i think with live and lemonade and how you put like you know the whole road trip into words it's just like i mm-hmm. the next time i listen to it like i could imagine like all of that yeah but since since we're on the topic you know since we're on the topic we'd also i'd also want to know like how do you go from like writing a song Like, what's any Amazon bought or sustain mic, mogaero, whatever, 
to working with like some of the i mean amazing because uh, you've told me about the producers that you worked with you know? yeah, so yeah from yeah. there to like going and working with the producers how does that journey it go? was it's just crazy okay? and i like to i say this often okay, where like i feel like i'm the luckiest guy in the world okay? just the way when so many things have happened to me and just the experiences that i've got to live i feel so fortunate okay? so the way it happened was that a mutual friend of mine or just basically a friend of mine um he was like hey wang like on sunday i see you're trying to make music and stuff i have a friend who's a musician you guys should on sunday meet up mm-hmm. and he when we i mean and there were so many hiccups okay, like i was busy he was busy all that stuff and so when we finally did meet um i don't know if you've seen that if you go on my instagram you can see okay, i was expecting him but he said his friend's a musician i was expecting on sunday 20s 30s go to tall, kaide, and so gangly, tattoo, tattoos, and then this like fifty-year-old guy shows up, like right? cowboy boots, smack, cowboy hat, leather jacket, and so and he throw daddy book at us, throw daddy book, and I'm like, huh? And then so we started talking, and then he had heard lavender lemonade, cool, just a small version I'd made okay, on my computer, and he really liked it, and so. From then on, I would go to his house and um, we would work on some other songs together. And then, yeah, so basically he he was like, he's the main guy who helped me. Basically, he just believed in Miki. And so he's the one who got me the opportunity to go to a studio and like record professionally and send me with some amazing artists. And... Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, so that's kind of how it happened. It's just like through a friend who was just trying to be nice, we ended up just being in this situation where I was in a studio, like an amazing studio for my first ever album. Yeah, and it's like, early it feels like a dream, okay? Just like what I was able to experience. But yeah, that's kind of how it came about. And he's also someone who's worked with like some really big names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show. No, he's insane. So he's worked with my two producers get chuck and evan um they've worked with artists like prince Unzani. like mm-hmm. he's yeah he's like not necessarily the most like famous person thought he's just been in the music industry for so long that like he's worked with some about, I, no 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 they're based in the states no no oh. yeah oh, yeah so no, you so. recorded all of this in the states yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything was recorded in America. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Everything was recorded okay. in America. And so... Vitisha needs uh, to do some guest research, right? So before yeah, coming bro. to the podcast. Come <laughs> on, that's like the most basic <laughs> thing. My bad. My bad. Instagram, what are you doing? Even so, yeah? Oh, my God. In my defense, I am inactive on Instagram. Um... <laughs> yeah, and so that's kind of how it happened is that he just worked with some incredible, but I'm f- forgetting some names, mm-hmm. but he's worked with some incredible, incredible people. Okay? He's just like such a music guy. Okay? Like I remember at one point, he, um, I was listening to this random song, okay? and he mm-hmm. was like, you know, I can tell you exactly what guitar and what mic this was recorded on. And I was listening to like Passenger or someone, and he was like, that was like, that's like a 1950s Gibson um hummingbird and i was like no way and i looked it up and that's the guitar he plays okay? and it's just like small stuff like that okay, where you can tell and suddenly like the reason i feel like my album uh, or personally i feel like my album uh, I'm so happy with how it sounds is majority them okay like i gave mm-hmm. them the most basic songs and they really made it into a super polished end product okay yeah i think like your nepali scene might say i can clearly see like that you know, one of the best produced music or like you know, i swear to god man like yeah. production mm-hmm. qualities is it's just another level like and the uh, like uh, and everything like instruments and everything uh, and so I'm li- when we did a gig together i'm like some class sessions mm-hmm. about that thing, okay? mm-hmm. like i couldn't imagine it without like the entire band okay? yeah yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, so obviously like thank you so much for being the part of like i'm the second thank you guys for sessions. having me that was oh, yeah that was sunflower sessions yeah shout out to sunflower sessions bro that was probably one of the coolest gigs i did especially like obviously in it was my first time playing with a band and the band was amazing mm-hmm. but it was just the whole like environment that you guys created and sending with the deal um curtain <laughs> nani, <laughs> nani. Nani. yeah it was really really cool <laughs> to be able to do that it's also really cool because 
like you said, Kia, but the album is so well produced in my opinion that when suddenly like when I hear it just with me, there are so many parts where it feels incomplete, Kia. Like there are songs mm. where I know attack you apart, Mate, there's a bass riff that happens or there's a drum. When suddenly so attack when I'm just playing that alone, so I can definitely tell that it sounds so incomplete, Kia. But you know one thing, I'm Lee, so some kind of sessions I'd say like the big party we did like a solo set ni. Yeah. Only I was like Titi Belate, I was like, damn, this guy is good. Like Unsani. Like <laughs> I I like not just an artist, okay, and not just a content creator, like I would like call you like an entertainer first, okay? Yeah. Uh, no? yes, yeah. yeah. Like cause because you the just give was really nice. Exactly, like just just one mic, guitar no boy, but I swear if you just like give this guy a mic, like and like just like stand him in front of a crowd of people, like they're entertained. Okay, he got day for them. Okay, yeah, yeah I, I think like that, for me, say I just really enjoy talking to the crowd. Okay, I just enjoy interacting on Sunny, and it's like at the end of the day, if you're just performing on stage, it gets kind of boring and repetitive. Okay? But mm-hmm. when you get to when you make little jokes and then because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, what I feel like is that every artist needs to tap into what they have that other people don't. Right. Like mm-hmm. I'll never be able to sing as well as some other artists or I'll never be able to play guitar as well as other artists. But what I do have going on for me is that I like to make jokes and I like to make people laugh. Mm-hmm. I like to entertain people. And so Whenever that's possible, say I, I like to in, like inject that into my set, okay? just so that when there's like something unique that people get when they come to my shows, it's not just the same old, same old me. Like even if you don't like my music and you don't like my how I perform, at least you should be able to be like, yeah, but it was fun. Man, sit on my Yeah, that's all I want is just for you to go away, and be like, yeah, that was fun. Like I, I'll do that again. On that uh, note. On that <laughs> note, the Mickey one now. On that note. Uh-huh. I know. Kind of wanted to rewind a little bit and go back to your childhood. Like, tell us how you mm-hmm. were as a child, because what you are now is probably the, you know, some of whatever you went through in your childhood and everything. Mm-hmm. So, where did this sense of humor come from? What were you like? Did you like to be the class clown, or how was how were you? Like yeah, bro. Growing up, I feel like I've yeah. always been the a, a class clown. Remember to pay like it. When we were young, Facebook man, there were those little like pictures and you could tag people. Tag, <laughs> yeah, and it was like a whole list like on Sunday, like do get you remember? You could Benjo just like tag your class, yeah, you could yeah. tag your class partner. Uh-huh. I was always like Mr. Funny or like a class uh-huh. clown on mm-hmm. Like it's always been really important to me that people laugh at my jokes. I was probably not the, I probably put too much importance. That uh, I've always enjoyed yeah. making people laugh and on Sunday like helping i don't know it just brings joy to people right so but say the mm-hmm. i was always like constantly making jokes like cracking jokes in class trying to make people laugh and i think i don't know i mean i think it comes like my family like all three of my siblings i think we're all pretty funny like we if you put the three of us in a room we we, we don't need anyone else okay? we just make each other laugh okay and we don't even have to say the whole joke if we, if we just say the first part of the joke everyone knows that the punchline exactly what the punchline is okay? we're so tuned in and so i think a lot of the humor comes from there um okay. but yeah growing up just yeah that's pretty much what i would Wait, say so like, since we're on the topic time. you've got three siblings including you so there's no no I, yeah i have two siblings i have two sisters two, two sisters you're the youngest uh, yeah yeah i know i'm the middle child i'm poor yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm, you know I'm we have this up. whole whole podcast about like the birth order theory okay? mm-hmm. so there's this whole book and it says like what's any so timi kun age so like timi oldest child boy when you're going to have certain characteristics and timi middle child boy when you're going to have certain characteristics and like youngest child or only child boy when you have certain characteristics when you and whenever like your manseko like birth order bhani bitike tyo kura dimag ma trigger bhai alni ke yeah yeah bro i get that so often they're like oh you're a middle child and i'm like yeah well i don't know i just feels normal to so me so the middle child trope is you're often forgotten <laughs> Nah, nah, and nah, you're forgot. like a free spirit. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I I think I'm definitely more of a free spirit than my two siblings. So mm. I don't think forgotten is uh... forgotten. But now let's say I was neglected by the parents type. Go upon you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. that two child is yeah, like obviously, the project. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the when you reach to the third child, you're just like, yeah, we've done this twice already. Yeah. Into bits of colitis. This is the case, right? Now, then. 
So, mm. But I'm also the only boy, is, though. So yeah, there's like at least different. a little bit of distinction in Sunny. Okay, he's a little bit different, but it. Oh yeah, that that's that's actually a good point because um, the first, second, third child boy. But if you're the firstborn guy, then you're technically a firstborn. Okay? So there are certain expectations. It's the technicalities, bro. We always drop in them technicalities. Yeah, bro. <laughs> Micro influencer <laughs> boy. I'm bro. Another fun oh. thing to learn about you, I mean, your gig plan out what I thought it's you were on a trek, and then I figured you're always on like a trek, like yeah, and bro. then I figured your whole family is always on a trek. <laughs> Can you tell us something about that? How I was growing up in like a mountaineering family here? Yeah, so my my dad say he has a very small trekking business, and um, so he like since we were very young, we've always been into hiking, trekking, and mm. like. Uh, we all have a very strong relationship with like mountains and nature. Like since we were very young, that's been ingrained on us. And so like for me, that's where I feel the most, most fulfilled. That's where I feel the most like energy is when I'm on a mm. trek. Like, and so, yeah, I get that so often. We're like, wow, team, it's a little chicken go down. So like this year, I think I went on like three or four again. Okay? And it's just mm-hmm. like over free time, f- f- five, six days with Nebela, like someone in my family or my sister or my dad would be like, there's this part of, there's this trek that we haven't done. Let's go, Vanera. And so mm-hmm. I think growing up today, we used to be like, eh, trekking, trekking, when you could be at home playing video games, like I'll be like, all my friends are playing video games. But uh, it's like not Stockholm syndrome, but it's like that key. Because you do it so often as a child, when you're, when you grow up, like that's kind of, what you gravitate back towards, okay? And so mm-hmm. now that the three of us, the three siblings, now that we're all older, like that's what we place so much importance on, okay, is being in mm-hmm. nature and hiking and trekking and being with the family. Because obviously mm-hmm. it's like the most bonding you can do as a family, I feel like is on a trek, okay? Because there's mm-hmm. nothing else to do, Nia. Yeah, there's the five of you yeah. on this trek, Unseni. Uh, a lot of places there's no network, there's no electricity. Right. And so you just like are forced to interact with each other. Okay? But if you go to the beach or if you go somewhere else, Unseni, Fone, they was a type of Tarabo on a trek that you walk with each other all day, you talk. And I feel like, yeah, it's just something that I think all of us enjoy a lot. Mm. Do you think uh, through songwriting or composing, all of it is also inspired from nature or the hikes that you've done mm, i think there's certain parts of certain songs where maybe that's like i think for like lavender lemonade say um lavender lemonade came about and suddenly when i was on a trip to colorado where we did a lot of hiking and mm-hmm. so like there's certain aspects of that road trip that are you know, that that song that are very influenced by that but there are other songs where I draw from a completely different place in my life. So I think there's, mm-hmm. I think it's like a very like on a case to case basis where like some songs say it's makes it's made a difference, but not all of them. Mm-hmm. All right. On a side note, on a side note, quick. So obviously you've been on a lot of tracks. And uh, if you want, like, so koi man tilitin na like suruma. No, what's like the best beginner track to go on? Man, what's your first suggestion? Nepal. Uh, I think Mardi track is really good. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I think it's short. I think you get to see some really nice views. I think there are a lot of like nice lodges and stuff on the way, so you're not super mm-hmm. unseni. Uh, like, do over if I send you on a more like rustic trek unseni, where the lodge is like just one tapro and then there's one day making why why, you're not really gonna enjoy that for your first one. So I think it needs to be a little bit luxury one. Then you don't send you the bottom nice park. Um, another one that I recently did is called the PK. PK PK Peak Trek. Okay? Is and it PK or Paiki? It's PK. Yeah. Yeah, I I just went there. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> So he <you> knows <laughs> that. I know, bro. Literally totally the day before I, the day before I went, okay, I was like, yeah, I was talking to a friend, I was like, yeah, bro, my PK Peak go right out here. He's like Paiki, by the way. And I was like, okay, Paiki Buddhist, huh? And then I went there and they were like all like PK PK. And I was like, this guy's full of shit, man. Well a Paiki one, you know? Yeah, more money, more money first now when I heard of that. I was like PK PK one, right? And Pochi, someone told me it's Paiki, and I was like, that sounds so wrong, but I think it. All the people in the area just say PK. Yeah. So then that's that, what that, I'm going to go by. It. Yeah, that's but what I'm going to go by. Where is this PK Paiki? So it's like uh, Soluma, okay? Yeah, all right. So Solukumbugu, Solumao. 
And the only annoying parts of the trek is that you have like a very long Jeep ride. Okay? So it's like eight to 10 hours. They're going there, coming back. So you kind of lose the, the trek itself is like very moderate. There's only one day where it's a little bit difficult and mm. you get to see like, you get to see from east to like east to west to Himalke. When you're at the top mm. at the viewpoint, like literally, and mm. so yeah, and it's like not that difficult and it's very like straightforward. So I think those are the two that I would recommend. Mm. I think PK is also very underrated, I know. Yeah, it's very, I think, bro, I think in the next few years it's going to blow up. Like I think yeah. in the next, yeah, I think in the next four or five years it's really going to blow up because it's like so accessible and it's short yeah. and the views right. are amazing. Like it was like a winning exactly. formula. Okay? And so it's the not that difficult. first time I heard about PK was 2018 or like mm. I mean, now it's like more people are going. Kind of yeah. So like early going when you can see like people are starting to build more hotels and suddenly like people mm-hmm. are starting to see the value. Okay. Because of the Everest Peace Camp, the ABC, got the got the go People mm. want something new, ni ani means it too. You don't have to fly. Jeep ma art kanda ma The roads are pretty good, and so mm. and the walk is very moderate, and so I feel like it's a very very um, easy track to do for some some mm. beginners. All right. So now we know like the beginners track. You know? Is there a track or a mountain peak that you aspire to like, you know, summit someday? Um, summit Bonnier, that's how I know. I think um, my favorite, say, my favorite mountain is Amadablam Bonnier. It's like, I don't know if you guys have heard mm-hmm. of it. But uh, if you go on the Everest track, so you see Amadablam. It's like such a beautiful mountain. Um, I don't have any dreams of like actually like climbing mountains that are... Uh, I would like to go back, but I've, I haven't been on the Everest Base Camp trek in like 10 years. Okay? It's been a very mm-hmm. long while. So I'd like to go back soon, probably next year. We we, we try to go this year. Okay? Thought, uh, mm-hmm. got it, a fight mm-hmm. or a fight or cancel. But we were stuck in the airport for like six hours one day. Mm-hmm. Ani, I think Chow is asking that because to... he actually has <laughs> dreams of summiting Mount Everest. Do you want to talk about really? that, Chow, a little bit? Uh, uh, someday, bro, someday. Tell us, uh, tell us about how you want to die, Chow. Oh my god, like why do you have to go there, like make it dark all of a sudden? No? <laughs> but, but, That's an interesting but, story, Bono, no, please. I mean, that is. Uh, talking about the base camp, I mean, last year the trip plan got rate, but unfortunately mm-hmm. we couldn't go due to some issues. But, uh, yeah, I, I think I like had some time to think about how I wanted to die. Okay? I think like I will come back to you about this question, you know. And like I was thinking about it, and what's like the best way to die, Khalilson? If you had to choose, if you could choose how you want to die, I felt like for me, say personally, I felt like I would just like go to the Everest summit, and on the way down, I would just like sit and just like like die, like you know, on the Everest. You know, if so, you like, die on Everest, oh, yes. you're stuck there forever. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point, you know. Yeah. That's the you whole point. Like I was a, like, a marker for other people, okay? <laughs> Showing people the yeah. way. I don't know, bro. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, that that'll be a fun way to go on it. I was like, when you know I'm old and I'm like, you know, like happy and content with my life, maybe I'll go climb the Everest and like stay there. How do you know you're gonna die on your way back though? What if you just sit there and you're just like cold for for a very long time and you're just like still alive bro this is not a logical answer please don't give logical question <laughs> it's just like a theoretical answer i mean like mm. in an imaginary situation but okay question same question back to you if you had mm. to if you could choose how you could die i think of old age in my sleep right mm. Yeah, just so old can. age and suddenly everything mm. is done and then one day I just sleep and don't wake up. I right? feel, yeah, actually, I, I, was, just, I, I actually was thinking of the same thing. Painless. Peaceful, like, yeah. Yeah, peaceful. Okay. Painless one then, just peaceful. Okay. And suddenly like, I'm content and suddenly my life is led. I've dropped all the songs that I wanted to drop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just and suddenly just in bed and sleeping and you just... Because I feel like death to me is just like an endless sleep. And so I feel like we just start off with the sleep and we just keep going. 
Have you thought about that though? Have you have you thought about like afterlife and stuff? Mm. So I don't believe in an afterlife. I just mm-hmm. like I just feel like one day we just stop. Like I kind of see our bodies as like machines, okay? And so mm-hmm. I feel like when suddenly as like a car breaks down, and suddenly like I feel like that one day we just stop working and then we just stop being like a, a conscious uh, human being. So I don't, I don't really. Mostly, I don't personally believe in an afterlife or in any like reincarnation, all that stuff. Uh, more agnostic in that way. I just feel like mm-hmm. you just stop existing, and then that's pretty much it. Okay. Mahasaya, like the only confusion that I have with that thought is, Mahasaya, I believe that we have a soul, and I believe with like energy, and so on. Like after like this body, your body say will die, you know. But where does mm-hmm. the energy or the soul go? And so again, Mahasaya, say. Like that is my confusion I, where that comes from. I get that. I know. Well, I mean, usually say I feel like Gunzani. I mean, say once we die, it's just over. Okay? There's just like black. Okay? There's no. Mm-hmm. Say, there's no heaven. There's no hell. There's just like nothing. Thought you hear these stories, ni, of like, hey, buddhiku, or like, <laughs> someone passes away and they, and then you see them again. Like this story, but I say, I'm like, damn. I wonder really if there is like something to be said, Gunzani, for the afterlife or people coming back with uh, you know unfinished business or whatever but I mostly say I'm just like oh after you die see it's, it's just over okay? there's no new beginning or anything it's just like an end mm-hmm. makes sense so on that note <laughs> on that topic <laughs> maybe we should like stir a little bit away from it because um uh-huh where are we even headed? <laughs> yeah, okay. But anyways, I also wanted to know about um, your life in the U.S. So how was it like? I think you spent uh, four and a half years there. Yeah, I spent about four. Yeah, I think with COVID, say so yeah, I ended up spending like four, four and a half. Um, mm. For me, it was it was good. It was. Um, I think initially it was like. Um, it was a big change from about when you born and raised in Kathmandu. It was a big change going to going to the U.S. So uh, with as time went on, say um, I became more and more comfortable, um, mm-hmm. and then yeah. So I, I think it was just like at the beginning, it was more of like a culture shock, but then just a different different environment. And I'm sure a child can like relate being in London. It's like just like different, okay? like you see, you like watch it on TV and suddenly like you see it on in movies mm. and stuff. But it's a bit different when you actually get to experience it. And then after a while, it starts to feel like home. That uh, I've been back for so long now. I've been back for like a year plus, where like that feels like a different part of my life, okay? Yeah. Like it just feels like I dreamt the whole thing and that I've always actually, I've just always been here. Hmm. Is there like some of the things that like them like oh shit? Yeah, the economy different ways, so they do not understand. Malay say, yeah, everything I've noticed is there's a lot of relatability issue, okay? Because I mean, say, like, as Nepali, we can't completely relate with Indians, we can't completely relate as Asians because they buy the theater Asian money, but they understand like Korean, Japanese, Chinese, like, and like, mm-hmm. like, Nepal is very unique in like a lot of ways, okay? Until like relatability it's only car okay who do you relate to then Khali? Mm. Mm. i think for me say um i think the more time you spend there the more like you develop this version of yourself like for example when i went to the u.s there was a version of myself that was a lot more american okay and that's kind of who i switched into when i was there and so it felt more natural and to be that specific part of me there mm-hmm. but uh in terms of like what i found very different i think the biggest like usually say i felt I was, it was very easy to um not very easy but it was more easy it was easy for me than for some other people i guess to transition from Kathmandu to the states okay but uh when i did feel a big difference was during covid okay? like i felt tunzani like i really really felt like nepal mabaku but i'd say there's more of uh it's less individualistic, okay? like America mm. Mate is more like Untani, like me. It's like I'll focus on me first, like I want to protect me first, like Untani, versus yeah. like in over here where 
you think more about the other person and you think more about your neighbors and your friends and mm -hmm. the people that you see on the street like you care more about their well-being um and how their well-being might affect how you feel as opposed to in the states where you're a little bit more and you focus on yourself and your own health and 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 that kind of stuff yeah i think that i've realized like it's a hierarchy you just yeah like when you're away from nepal you appreciate like those things a little more okay about how like the whole society basically is very communal mm -hmm. and one of the things is like everywhere you go people just like look after you and it's it's very yeah. like and it, plus you know a lot of people and plus like people are just extremely friendly you know or, like don nepali or london my bete when even it's extremely friendly okay? yeah and, bro like, by the Nepali manchu to buy the beauty and say it's a different community ke like on sunny mm. every time i used to run into someone from nepal when i was in the states like let's say i went to a, a restaurant or something free ko khana le dine ke la bhai khao hai on the like on sunny like extract le dine ke like they're like so on sunny afno manchu type ko ke um and to when you let's say you become so much more appreciative on sunny of where we come from and mm. like our background I think that's a psychological thing as well because I think this same thing I've heard with so many people who stayed abroad gig. Mm. And you when you're um outside like out of your own country alone your brain just like seeks for familiarity is okay? Yeah. And when you that see someone yeah. who's from your own country your brain just like shoots up like dopamine and oh my god yes can't you go. Yeah. Mm. psychologically when that's apparently a thing where you seek comfort and familiarity knowledge creed dropping them bombs bro <laughs> she said technically just it's just dopamine bro she said you don't feel it's it actually <laughs> it's nothing it's nothing emotional it's or cultural human. bro it's, it's just human. dopamine yeah mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense but i still like to Romanticize and say, "I'm in Nepal, you know, so I'm still a certain type of a sentiment." No, no, I'm not trying to say it's not that. Hmm. Like, like I know. remember, okay, mo New York, mo mero satiru like patrons ani bela. I'm here at kunsi restaurant gati ke ano purno ke dal lagi diwai kunsi restaurant gati ke ani dal baat mo thi an thayko dali free mat. He brought chai ke. I'm like, so I'm like, I was like. I was like, damn, <laughs> nowhere else, bro. And that one chai, bro, imagine, that's like nothing near a chai when I go there. But I still remember okay, how like good it made me feel and how like loved it made me feel. Okay? Mm -hmm. The small, small things, bro. More of an incident. I mean, like, so we're going to Miro, like, Pupu go to the time. So Pupu also lives here. And there was me, Miru D, and then there's another D Kosati, and she's from New York. And you would say like she's from New York, she's American, so like so you would like say Nepali culture as a whole because their roommates wild shocking lacks again. So we went to this Nepali restaurant to pick up some you know, sweets or before going to mm. Kumai, no. And he would have let's say cake book it earlier, okay. So we had to wait there for a couple of times. And I had to say no. And I've obviously died or that's probably Nepali name on side, no? Because that you extreme freeze my lactic, no? Like till we wait one, no? And I no question. That's like the simplest thing, no? You know? Mm -hmm. And I died a lot, you freeze my lactic, you. And the New York girl is just shocked, okay? Like, have you met him before? No. I was like, how do like somebody just like? Was it him? Was it the freeze my lactic in some other place? It's like, I mean, we don't even think, no? Yeah, like, bro. It's yeah. it's like Kine it's just okay, no? Okay, okay, but for mm -hmm. people here. It's like a huge thing. Okay? You don't you don't just do things for others. Okay? Yeah. Do mm -hmm. it. Say, yep. And now staying at the topic of your life in the U.S. I don't know if a lot of people know that you have a degree in. Yeah, in computer like, science. Bro is into hardcore. No, no. No. Not necessarily. Little? Uh huh. Not necessarily. A little bit. I mean, I think. Um, When I was growing up, it always, like especially school, my like it was always fun. Like I always enjoyed my computer classes, and so when I went abroad, uh, you also see it's like the immigrant thinking of well, you go abroad to a study. What are you gonna do? Something that gets you a job. Something like something, yeah. something that'll that'll keep you there. 
And so at that point, it like made the most sense. Also, like I didn't know what to do in Sunny. I had no idea what I wanted mm. to do. So I was like, if I'm going to be confused, I might as well be confused with the job. Um, <laughs> but then, like I, I think I knew pretty pretty early on that like it wasn't necessarily the thing that fulfilled me the most. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, I never really saw it being <clears throat> like the foundation of what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Okay? Like I knew mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to be that guy for the rest of my life, just like working um, behind a computer and so just doing code. And so I think that's one of the big reasons why I, I came back is because I just like, I was like, I was like, I was young, and so, all right, I guess I am young, and I was like, I guess there'll be no other point in my life where I can just suddenly make these kinds of decisions where I want to pursue music and not necessarily do it for the rest of my life professionally, and suddenly like this is what I'll do to earn a living, but just to explore what the possibilities are, and suddenly at least for at least a few years, just to just to see what I can do, okay. So that when I'm going back to the first thing that we talked about, so that back when I'm 50 years old and I'm looking back at my life, I'm like, I did it. When suddenly, like, I can now show my kids like the music videos and the stuff that I do, and suddenly I can look back at my kids and be like, ah, your dad did that. When suddenly, like, look at that, like, because I, I feel, I feel like, like at the end of the day, work is work, right? That uh, I feel mm -hmm. like you kind of have to have some things that you're very passionate about that you can show mm -hmm. show people. I feel like as you're talking about this, I feel like there was a transitioning period where you had to make a decision to like, you know, like doing music or like you know, coming back. I mean, probably US Sunny intention, was it to like go there and maybe I'm going to settle here upon Ethiopia? Was it always that I'm going to come back and do something in Nepal? I think when I went for the first, like when I initially went, say I wanted to stay there and say like settle there, work there. But then... Theo, during COVID, I had a lot of time to think for myself and I was just like, life is too short to not take risks, not, not, not take risks. Like, mm -hmm. like I said, yeah, I feel like I, I sound like a broken record that uh, I would, I just saw myself so vividly. Like I can't explain to you guys how clearly I saw myself at 50, just being like, yeah, I'm really too. When I was 24, like, I think regardless of how much money I make and all that stuff, like, I just didn't want to grow up and still have all that regret in me. And so I think mm -hmm. as, yeah, as COVID <laughs> happened and I had more time with myself, I kind of just came to the conclusion that, like, if I want to go back, there will always be ways to, like, if I want to go back abroad, there are always ways to, to do it. But mm -hmm. I'll never be 24 <clears throat> again, like, I'll never be, but if I'm like 28 and I want to go back to Nepal and make music, like at that point, there's a lot more responsibilities. You're a lot older. It mm -hmm. becomes less of a thing that you can do. Okay, I realized at that point, say, I was at a point in my life where that was it. Okay, like that's when I could do it. And then if I waited any longer, it would just become too risky or it just wouldn't be the right move at that point. Okay. Right, like if you're abroad and you have a job and kids and a wife, like there's no way you're gonna move back to Kathmandu and then suddenly like make music videos and suddenly like that's like just like that's not something you can do, Nita. So I kind of like recognized that I was at a very like pivotal place in my life where I could afford to um, pursue something that I really found important and I really wanted to do. Talking about like affording to explore yeah. there's a lot of privilege that comes into play about <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah when we yeah. talk about we being lucky is that because a lot of people who have gone abroad like and this is speaking for all of us and saying a lot of people who have gone abroad people have met here oftentimes there's a lot of things they want to do that are it's circumstances that ha like they have to stay abroad and like send money back home. Yeah, like, yeah, a yeah. lot of times they can't afford to take that risk. And yeah. obviously like it's also it comes with a lot of privilege. And it, and like I've heard your other interviews and I, I like how humble you are and how aware you are of like and all of that things. And uh, did at any point like did you like realize that, you know, uh, all of these things that uh, maybe I have the privilege to do this. So I should yeah. or I might. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think I was very aware of my privilege. And that's one of the reasons that I was like, 
if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it, right? Because I understood that I was in a position that very few people have that kind of luxury where my parents were supportive, where um, they didn't financially depend on me to work there and send money back, where mm -hmm. I could come back. And Munsuni, like, I had the, the opportunity to, to do all these things. And so, which is why I felt so compelled to at least give it a shot because i was like i have this like chance that so many people would kill for okay when suddenly like mm -hmm. parents who are supportive of their kid trying to do something with their with his music with his passion um parents who can afford to have a kid who and suddenly like tries to take those risks and risks and and take that direction and so I felt like because I was so aware of my privilege and what a privileged position I was in, I felt very compelled to at least give that a shot. Okay? And mm. yeah, and I also knew that like, right, like just growing up in the environment that I've grown up in and just like being in the network that I've grown up in, like I knew that I just, if I came back, I would have a good shot of at least something like, you know so many people and so when you grew up in Kathmandu and you went to the schools that we go to like you know so many people like on Sunday, oh that restaurant that in Sunday always has friday night gigs like that's usko uncle ko unsani or ule chini ko seko and so i just knew that like all these small things just added up to a point where i just like yeah i really understood that i was in a position that um a lot of people i feel like would have been unsani or like a lot of people would kill to be in and so i knew that i kind of wanted to or if i didn't do it how, how much i would regret it and so yeah like has anyone ever told you i was just because you've gone up and like come to fame like one of yeah. in the music industry in a very short period of time once any people have tried doing this like it takes a lot of time whereas like once any mm -hmm. for you it was like I and mean, has has anybody ever like told you like you have it easy or like it's just because you have this or it's just because illi gorda ho whenera has no, anybody I think the the only person who says that is me like I think mm -hmm. like I really no I, I really do believe that like anyone else in my position would have also been able to uh not necessarily achieve what I've achieved but would have had a much easier time okay? like I think mm -hmm. Like I really, I feel like I'm very realistic about my music and something like I, I, I don't think I make the best songs and something. I don't think I have the best voice or I'm the best writer, but I think I do certain things that, um, when you combine everything together, it just makes like a more compelling final product. But yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, if anyone says that, I mean, I'll, I'll wholeheartedly agree that like I've had it way easier than ninety nine percent of artists that try to make it here on Sunny and. Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm very like I like that knowledge is not like lost on me in any way. Okay? Like I like I really I agree, um, and I feel very fortunate and I feel very grateful to be in this position. And yeah. So when was it that you realized you had so much privilege? Um. I think, I mean, I think I've just been, in terms of like music wise, I think it's like when I was, right? Like the fact that I got to record my first ever studio album um, mm -hmm. in like an amazing, like it's like a world-class studio. And I got to work with like artists that I've worked with so many like big shot, big, when something like big shots or some Bazaar people played on my record. And when I knew that I could come back to Nepal and pursue music, quite seriously and then my parents would be supportive like mm -hmm. i think i always understood like how lucky i was for all these things to fall into play and yeah i'm not i'm not very cocky about the so far the success that i've had so far like i do agree and there's a lot of it that just comes down to um circumstance and so it's just like being in the right place at the right time or just having the right situation is so much more important for success both in like music and in life like i'll wholeheartedly agree that there are so many artists like even in Kathmandu and nepal there's so many artists that make better music than i do or and so you are more deserving i guess of the limelight than me but just so happens that i 
had it instantly like I was able to um, do what I've done. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think I've just, I guess to answer your question, it's um, from the very beginning, I think I've been very aware of uh, the privileged position that I've been in with my music and mm. how things have gone. So obviously after that, I think let's go back to music and the music industry and gigs in general. Mm -hmm. But small as it for me, a huge part of music is, is live events. Mm -hmm. okay? You know? And we'll come back to how the music industry is in Nepal. But before going there, like, uh, have you always been uh, into a lot of live gigs? And what was like the first gig you remember vividly? Like, going, like performing like, or attending? Attending. I think like that Bro, is where like you know, it ever starts concert, from. Yeah, the first ever concert I remember attending is Brian Adams. Go. Do you guys remember? Wow. Brian Adams that. came to Nepal Masala. Yeah, when he came to um, Masala, bro. <laughs> That's like the first ever concert I remember attending. And my mom somehow had finessed these like VIP tickets. Okay, you know where you were in the beginning of the crowd. And yeah, I mean, only there was a huge crowd already I mean, and me and my friends there with two we were like grade seven and put two. We started till late, till late, till late, till through the thing, you know what I mean? Till late, till late, till late, till late, till late, till thing till late, I remember looking up it, and that was like, I've, since then I've been to, I've been to like Daniel Caesar, John Mayer, like when I was in the States, but that Brian Adams show, okay, I feel like it'll, nothing will ever top that for me, okay? Just like mm -hmm. the energy he had, being in that crowd, just like, I feel like there was like magic in the air that night, okay? And he, yeah, that, so that, that kind of um, really started off my love for live music. And then, yeah, I think every time I've performed, like, that's the energy that, that I'm trying to tap into, okay? Like, mm -hmm. even even one person in the crowd feels the way I, like, comes to my show show and feels the way I felt that night. Like, that's a huge success, okay? Because that's, like, a core memory. That is, like, a cornerstone of who I am as a human being. You know, it's in the fact that I got to experience that. I just remember everything, okay? crazy yep and in one that that's the whole thing about live events here. it's like it's it's insane okay? and just the sharing that space with like yeah. so many people who yeah. every everyone's there for the same reason okay and you can just feel the energy off of the entire crowd and you can feel the energy mm -hmm. off of like coming off of the stage off of the artist it's just mm -hmm. like the insane environment man yeah, yeah. The brand was so the crazy there too. He filled up Rangasa like yeah, I remember looking back yeah. and everything was full. Okay. Mm, I think that was the first uh, international artist to ever come in Nepal. Yeah, I think so. Because I think after them, they brought like Michael Learns to Rock and yeah. they tried yeah. to bring a few other people. But that was like the first and the best, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Eh? It was, I remember being just also the fact that I was so young and impressionable and suddenly just mm -hmm. seeing this guy that was like yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. like so the uh, Brian Adams concert in that day. The moment I was like in grade seven and I was studying in India, and you know? like it's so not on roads. I had like uh, Brian Adams got tickets or so because there's extra tickets or the okay? Like mm. uh, we got it through some like organization or need that some like Saturday because there were passes or the okay? But they would see, Miro flight was like four days ahead of the concert. And so, cause the more like like more roy karai more like the concert like boss with the era, you know. And they were like, I, I, <laughs> so more our hostel guy, you know, no hostel guy, but see, and then Bangalore ma Metallica was playing, okay. Yeah. And like the saddest thing is Metallica concert, but ni like my friends had all gotten tickets because everybody lived in Bang Bangalore, mm -hmm. and they were like, made a flight was Metallica concert, like. Made a flight today, made a little concert like Porsi. Like, two, one, like, Tomo Inama, I missed two concerts. More, it's so like, your <laughs> life could regret. Like, I, I'm still, like, two, regret moments in my life. I vividly remember the Brian Adams one. I always like. Two Brian Adams could shoot the crazy thing. I'm very sad you missed that, yeah. The insane thing. I think for me, this the moment it was the Damon Rice Wala concert. Mm. Uh, yeah, Damon Rice came to came to Nepal? Yeah. yeah bro. Yeah. Wait yeah. when? 
Pattern Museum of Bodhi, bro. Wait, when, bro? Was a camera, was it? Yeah. You played what was this? 2018, 2019? 18, 19, man. Yeah, I was probably yeah. in America then. Mm-hmm. I really, really like yeah. Damien Rice. I would have loved to go. Exactly. It was like it wasn't like Athena the mainstream artist Kali Thenanda. That's a so very like niche. The crowd yeah. was, yeah. So the crowd was very um, cozy and you know, everybody like. That's when the that's when it's most special. Okay, even for me as an artist, that's when it's most special is when everyone's there for the music. Okay. Yeah. Like I think uh, sometimes for me, say, uh, but obviously, you know, I I haven't been able to perform like, but still growing very much so. There are the few times that I've been able to perform where everyone is there solely for the music. It's like the most intimate and sunny. It's like the most yeah. like supportive. Like you really feel the love from the crowd. Okay? And, mm. and then that's when you, I feel like as an artist, you feel the most safe. And that's when the, like that's when you perform the best. Because when you're so, it feels like home. Okay? And I mm. feel like, because right when you're like nervous, when you're trying to prove yourself to like a more like, if the crowd is a little bit like skeptical of you as an artist and you're trying to prove mm-hmm. yourself, you overcompensate. But when you can mm-hmm. feel that support and the love from the get-go, it really puts you in such a comfortable and safe um, mindset, okay? And I think, mm-hmm. like, I remember I played at So Far Sounds, okay? And it was mm-hmm. a really, <clears throat> it was a really, like, small, intimate thing. And just, like, it was just so, it just felt like playing for my family at home, okay? It was just so relaxed. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that's how it was there as well, right? Because it's Damien, right? It's like, not everyone knows yeah. him if it's by yeah. the museum or even calm like it's a small enough venue where it's like everyone's there for the music also i'm sorry if i sound very nasally i have a bit of a cold right now that's fine yeah <clears throat> but tell us about your i like, recent um shows that you did saint mary's and katapata you were posting some videos so yeah was, bro the crowd seemed crazy how was it like i've it was insane it was it was crazy because um, so I used to do a lot of gigs, I used to mm-hmm. restaurant or my bar, or my, I used to play everywhere. And then I just got to a point where I was like, now say I want to be more selective about the shows that I do. And so mm-hmm. again, like, right, like I have the privilege to not depend on music for my uh, livelihood. So I was like, all right, well, I'll exercise that privilege to just do shows mm-hmm. that bring joy to my life and bring fulfillment. And mm-hmm. so... St. Mary's happened through a friend of mine who called me. I was actually on Trek, bro. Um, I was on Trek and she called Again. me. She was like, <laughs> yeah, I was on Trek and she called me. She was like, oh, bro, me a point to make them to a fan. Oh, St. Mary's, what team are fan? Hey, fans, uh, do you want to go perform for this like charity event? And right, like for me, the main thing when I perform is I just want to perform in front of a crowd that appreciates me. And mm-hmm. so I was like, sure, let's do it. And like, I think. Right, like I knew that like St. Mary's is like a young crowd, and so I knew that that's kind of where most of my fans are. Thought, uh, I didn't expect the kind of reception they gave me. Okay? Like I literally felt like such a rock star. Okay, bro, I walked in with my guitar, and the the main organizer who I talked to was going to say, "Oh, just feel, oh, just feel the money. Die, I'm here. They didn't post no, they didn't talk about that. You need to do that. Still get it. They took me upstairs, eh? and people were asking for photos. They're like, oh, please, I, I think she also enjoyed that power again. She was like, oh, yeah, please, like he'll come past you, and then you can take pictures. Ani, and then I went out to the the, the little hall that they had. Ani, as soon as I walked outside, bro, everyone's clapping crazy. Eh? I was like, damn, this is insane. Ani, malatunyalehni like last day did I Every time I would look, they're like, ah, showing a heart sign. I'm like, bro, it's the last day did I bro. Mother on stage, mother here, bro. Say again, mother. Hey, Ricky, when Sunny put out, I love you. One day, I was like, bro, this is too much for me to handle. Um, but yeah, it was so sweet, bro. It was so supportive. And it was so funny. So when we were leaving, say, um, people started coming for pictures and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and, the, and then basically the teachers were like, you can't let too many people form a hool because I'm telling you, like, it's a festival. Like, we have to close. We have to do stuff. And so these little, like... <laughs> 13 year old girls formed a ring around me, and they escorted me out, eh? 
It was the funniest thing. I was like, this feels like a dream. And then he like the most random <laughs> thing. And the funniest <laughs> thing was, I felt like a celebrity. No, no, no. And get put you, but you say bye, one. And no, no, And get put you, but you get cut it, but you say I'm back to back to real life. Okay? No one gives a fuck. Okay? And then you get by the book, but you get. It's just within that small space. But yeah, the mm-hmm. same areas. Um, the performance was really fun. And yeah, I think that's just like. It's just so nice okay, when you know what you like as soon as you step on stage, you know that the crowd is there to support you nee? and you're not trying mm-hmm. to win them over. You're not trying to get them to like you like you're just trying to make them have a good time. And I feel like that's so much more fun to do than try to win them over and suddenly all that stuff is mm-hmm. like so much more. It's not forced. Okay? It just happens so much more organically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds like an amazing experience, man. Oh. I was like, I was like, bro, these girls are half my size, eh? I said, I said, you know, I'm a bodyguard, but, eh? And there's girls trying to come get an autograph. They're like, Oily, Ellen, please, please, please. <laughs> like, I said, he goes, I'm going to be power tripping. I said, it's still good, you know? Kick him out of the way, right? But I think, like, uh, kids, like, there's just, like, purest energy, get, like, still. Yeah, uh, bro, it's just, like, the authentic. sweetest, okay? It's just true, so, yeah, it's just so, like, Heartfelt as well, okay. It's just mm-hmm. yeah. Because at that age, you don't really care neither about a lot of mm-hmm. things. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. all of that emotion comes very uh, authentically, authentically. Yeah, yeah. And it's just yeah, it was just so sweet. Like it was really just like a very nice, very worth it, worth my time, Banuna. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Obviously, now it's it's been quite like one one and a half years that you've uh, been um Nepal music industry almost two years now. Uh, actually, no. I dropped my first album this year of Feb, or I dropped mm-hmm. my first song in at the beginning of Feb la- this year. So it's not even mm-hmm. been a full year. Damn. But like yeah. since the time, like you only like short span what you spent mm-hmm. in like the Nepali music industry, you know, mm-hmm. uh, if you can call it that. And uh, mm-hmm. how has the whole scene been? Now? Like, what have you learned? Or like, you know, what are like the key one? Like, it's the boy they own too. Because there are a lot of things you need to. There are a lot of things to be worked on, okay, Nepal Mate. About me also being involved in like, you know, organizing events for like the last couple of years, like on and off, on and off, but then like mm-hmm. involved in a lot of events. Like there's there restrictions or events for event organizers. And plus then you come to a point where like artists or who don't get like Ram really well paid, you know. Yeah. I mean, then there are again a lot of Kudaru. Yeah. So I will come to you first. Like what are the main Kudari you've learned and what are the Kudari you don't like? What are the Kudari you like? Um this those are key this one. Obviously Unsini it's not been enough time, I don't think. Um mm. but what I will say I think is all, to all the artists, Unsini, before you do a gig, I think you kind of have to stand up for yourself as well. So be very clear about payment with the with the venues and Sunny, be very clear about okay well i need this amount before we take the stage i need this amount within this many days since like you like after i perform um and i think like that is very important okay and if possible get it when like a signed contract okay um and that's easier said than done and Sunny, if you have a little bit of leverage say you can do that but if you're a struggling artist who just wants work then it's a little bit harder but I think you shouldn't be afraid to stand up for yourself as an artist when any like to like if you do the job you should get paid, okay? That's how I yeah. feel. Um and so yeah, and so I think that's like the main thing. And I think um otherwise for me, I think the main thing has just been like focus like oh you see, um advice I would give artists is that like it's not enough to just make music anymore, okay? Like you like there's so many people every day making great songs, okay? But a lot of the times you don't hear about them because they only focus on the music. And I think right now you kind of also have to focus on how you want to market it, how you want to push it. Um, I think that's become really important as well. Uh, if not as important as making music is learning how to push it. Um, so I think like, yeah, if you're a new artist, I think definitely like study how you can use social media, how you can use um, apps like you know, like TikTok. If you're if you're an up and coming artist and you're not on TikTok and you're not posting a very like you don't have to make 
content like I do, okay? Making jokes and shit. But you can just make content related to your music. But if you're not doing that, then I think you're doing yourself a really big disservice, okay? Like, if you're not using every avenue possible to push your music. Because there's only so much that the music will do for itself, okay? There's, like, a lot that you have to do for it as well. Mm-hmm. Dude, my biggest true. takeaways are make sure you get paid and make sure, you, uh, make sure you're on TikTok. So, um, also wanted to talk about TikTok and your journey with content creation. Mm-hmm. So, how how did it start? Because you did start with um, song covers, or right now, and you also, yeah, 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 yeah. So I own initially. I only did like covers, okay, little like snippets on Sunday. I remember like I only did a people got there. My little can't help falling in love, and then yeah, I think one it was. Day, can't help falling in love while I'm with the first one because I was like, oh my god. Because the voice can't deep on the on it's just like what's the chit of cash in the Yeah, deep so that means so I think you're fan of me. Initially so I just posted because like Yeah. I think I've said this on a different interview as well, eh? Um the only reason I ever made TikTok was for my music. Eh? Like I've said this mm-hmm. before, I think is that when I made TikTok, it was I was like in my head I was like, "Ik na din to moy ora git nikal su to git nikal ni bela say." I just want people to know me enough where they're like, "Hey, you man, you live in git nikal yo." Let's play. Let's like you saying. Let's click. Actually, kiss a room now, because I felt like I had it in me once they clicked play to put out a song that they would enjoy, or at least a lot of people would enjoy. But I just wanted to get that recognition where I would get that first click. And so mm. that's the only reason that I ever did TikTok. And I think that's the only reason I still do TikTok is the day that I get to a point where I'm confident that a lot of people will listen to my music regardless of Munzani. Like the day that I know that if I drop a song as a bully, there will be a lot of people who have listened to it. I think mm. I'll just stop making TikTok videos. Or I think I'll stop posting the way I do right now. Um yeah. How many, um, how many uh, TikToks do you make per week? You not have, that like, many. Set? Not that many. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily the the actual like making of the TikTok. It's just like constantly being in like, oh, I need to make a TikTok. Because mm-hmm. if you're not regular on the app, it hurts you. Okay? So what, if you're posting mm-hmm. after three months, your views are not going to do the same. Okay? Even if you have an amazing video. Your views aren't going to do the same. So you know, like, this app is, bro, this app is so crazy. In the back of my mind, I'm always like, oh, like, I'm always thinking of content ideas, okay? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. a lot of that is fueled by the desire to stay relevant enough that when I drop a new song, people choose to listen. But mm-hmm. I think when I get to a point where I can drop a song and people will listen regardless of whether or not I post TikToks, I think I'll just... Post when I want to post and not necessarily when I feel like I have to post. Um, yeah. But yeah, so but that, go back to your actual question. No, sorry. I'll go ahead. But that being said, like now TikTok has also kind of become a job because I, I feel like you've also got paid endorsements or yeah. on TikTok. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, that's like not important at all, though. Like I'll mm-hmm. happily, I'll happily let go of that aspect if it means that I'm not constantly thinking about what new content to create. Like, mm. I think people think like it's very easy. Okay? And when you compare it to jobs, to some other jobs, it is very easy, right? Like I just make a, I just make a dumb joke and I put it on TikTok and, and, that, and that's that. But I think when you think about the psychological aspect of always thinking, like, all the time if i'm driving if i'm eating if i'm hanging out with someone always in the back of my mind is like how can i turn this into content like how can i leverage this experience to create a con to create content that's engaging and i think like the day i'm able to to just like let go of that part of my life i'll be and something just just like more content okay because it is really nice Mm -hmm. to entertain people and it's really nice when people are like oh it makes me laugh so much but it's also Nice to be pressure. able to just yeah pressure one then just that constant like it's never like you're never switched off okay? like you're mm-hmm. always switched on about oh the next thing I'm gonna make the next video the next TikTok the next like idea and so I think the day I think I get to just like 
just trying to get to a point where if I think of a funny video that I'm like, oh, this is nice, I get to make it. Okay? Instead of having to be like, oh, okay, what's the post going on? You use multi post going on, what's the post going on? Like, oh, what's the post going on? I think like that's when it becomes more of a chore and less less fun. Okay, because when I initially started making TikToks, like to go back to your earlier point, hey, eh, it was. I was just singing and stuff, and then one day I just made the most dumb TikTok. I forgot what it was, but I remember. I'll always mention this. My sister, okay, my older sister, she texted me and she was like, hey, "What are you doing, bro? Like this dumb joke. Like, just focus on singing." And that joke went viral. Okay, I forgot what it was, and I was like, "Okay, clearly there's like something here that people enjoy," and so I kept like putting, I kept like, I guess balancing my singing with like the. Mm. funnier tiktoks and that's when i really started to grow okay because before that i think i was at like 100 followers or like 50 followers and then when i regularly started posting jokes and stuff is when i like really started um seeing an increase in my followers and seeing an increase in people being like oh i've seen you on tiktok <laughs> my tiktok said i know man i've always been like very conscious about like posting on tiktok i guess But uh, again, like talking about how algorithms work and how apps work and how content creation work, because about uh, we've also been doing this podcast like on and off for like two plus years now. It's almost mm -hmm. getting close to two and a half years. And like about mm -hmm. Surumati, we started with like every single week we'll put out the content. Yeah, over. and then we started realizing that for each. Like long format content, you have to do a lot of research, especially when you're having a guest, and especially when you're doing on a topic that needs research, you know. Yeah. So I'm would say a lot of put on a lot of content that we do is like on maybe like all the serious topics or or like topics that do need. You don't think I'm serious, just, bro? I'm bo. On it, bro. I know, I know. I've seen, I've seen your older episodes, bro. I know what you're talking mm. about. Yeah. 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 See, and then we've also had this discussion a lot of times, okay? Like when you have to push because like the app demands you, and so you have every single week you're like, "Oh my God, another one!" See, it dips down. So like somehow, say, but we had to take a break in between, okay? Because like mental sanity, and so need the all the sanity. Bro, it's so needed. It's so needed. I remember. I feel like everyone goes through it. I but I'll speak for the people on TikTok. I don't know the podcast crowd, eh? That uh, I remember earlier this I'm, month, I'm like pod, earlier. podcast crowd, I'm not saying there's a bone to pick with you, bro. Can there's I, a know? bone to pick with you. Hey. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll we'll come back to that. That what I, what I was saying was um, mm -hmm. around April this year. Okay, I felt so burned out. Okay, like I had no ideas and so I mm -hmm. felt like I had expended every bit of creative, like juice, like juice that I had. Okay, and I remember. Do you guys know Mr. Bibosh? I don't know if you guys know Bivosh. Oh yes, yes. Bivosh mm -hmm. Pai, so he actually I know him partly there. I met him earlier a few weeks ago because we, I don't know if you guys saw our TikTok where we were like fuck boys come to play Deusi Bai. Right, right. Uh huh. Take a two Moscow Garzani Bela. He also was talking about how he feels like he has no more ideas left and how he really needs a break. And I feel like mm -hmm. we all go through those patches, mm -hmm. where there's only so much you can think of, key, and there's only so much creative content that you can make. Uh, or creative like it's only how so much like how creative you can be before you need a break okay? and you need to mm -hmm. like recharge and mm -hmm. i think like everyone goes through that okay where you really do need to step away for a bit to come back and start giving people what they want again okay because if you just continue and you're burnt out it'll show in your content okay where it's just worse and worse and worse and worse and i feel like that's not good for anyone Yeah, yep. but I think the aspect might say it's a little bit uh, easier for us, at least for TikTok, because I'm a long form on the content. Yeah, yeah. So yeah we can yeah. just like uh, break it down into pieces. So, but we yeah. we do have to sit down for, like, the chunk naked to research for like say chunk ne boss and person. Yeah. I mean, once it's yeah. done, we can kind of like you know, um, channel that in different uru platforms. I would say. In that way is different. Um, I think uh, with this we've kind of come to an end for our podcast. So, Mister, so is there anything you want to ask? Uh, I think we covered most of the things, you know. But 
Mm. Now we can just uh, freestyle for a while even if you don't have anything to talk about we'll just wrap it up then. Wang then is there anything you would want to tell your fans your viewers your supporters uh, uh your well wishes uh I say this quite often but I just want to say thank you to everyone on Sunny like um I really like every time I'm on stage and I see people singing with me and mm-hmm. they're like so supportive and they show me so much love and it really does like it moves me so much okay? and it inspires me and it pushes me to continue making new music and putting stuff out that I think people will like and yeah I just mm-hmm. want to reemphasize like how lucky you guys make me feel and how loved you guys make me feel and how grateful i am that i'm able to share this share this experience with all of you um that being said um i have a new music video coming out soon for my wow. song Kathmandu Cowboy yeah um and Ooh. then 2024 <laughs> i think is when you guys will sorry 2023 is when you'll hear like <laughs> new music i know i know sorry sorry 2023 is when you'll hear new music in terms of okay. like it's not been on my album because so far it's that we've just been dropping songs that are already dropped on spotify and feb that uh 2024 tw- sorry 2023 matsi you guys will hear songs that are currently being written and w- worked on right now so there's yes, a lot more in the works there's a lot more in the works and hopefully you guys enjoy it and yeah i'm just so trying to make are you working on an entire like, album right now I'm just working on songs. Um mm-hmm. I think yeah, I think I'm going to focus on releasing a single ski. I think I just mm-hmm. like because in, mm-hmm. like I've re- I've recorded an album and it's a bit of an arduous process ski. Like it is mm-hmm. a lot to have like 7 8 9 songs finished within a time span. Um I think it meant that I didn't get to give some songs as much attention as it was in, like I think I'm trying to for at least the next few songs that I drop I want to be more attentive just a bit more perfectionist just a bit more until like when I drop it I think I want to be just like have spent a lot more time on it and I think that comes with being able to focus on one item at once um mm-hmm. yeah so I think the next few songs that you'll hear from me will probably all be singles but then hopefully I can go and then record an album as well and I don't know. I don't know what's to come, but hopefully you guys are all, all along for the ride. Not say personally, I'm like super super excited for the music video of Kathmandu Cowboy because I've seen like all of the bits and pieces of Funza need the yeah, BTS bro, that that's too. going around. Okay? Me because too, I knew like eta eta uti dekhira hunsa eta shoot gorra sa ka shoot gorra sa na ambo bro to you know. Goda to re auni hota bro. Goda bro. Yeah yeah yeah. So we still have a bit to shoot ke. Okay? Uh uh-huh. we still have we still have the shoots the shoots left in Kathmandu so before that say I'm talking to sponsors and all that all that yeah, yeah, yeah. super mm-hmm. fun uh-huh. stuff is happening behind the scenes right now <laughs> so uh, hopefully mm-hmm. we get that sorted quickly and I can I can I can drop the song cuz this is the like, song that yeah. I've been waiting to drop for a year okay like this is yes, sir. this is my magnum opus like this is ah, this is like my masterpiece well, ever Yeah I think like you say like Nepali music seed ma say there is like nothing only could compare or to mean your particular like it's it's like yeah. Nepali country pop ke, which we don't yeah. really have but no yeah you know and like the first I time I heard this song and I was driving you know and I was just like kicks in and like the voice and Sunny oh bro yeah. like I was like this is fun like when you're driving this car and I just wish it was a horse ke, yeah bro So the way that song came about was I was in the studio okay and mm-hmm. the two producers that I work with say the music that they usually make for themselves is more like country bluegrass I'd say like blues type okay so when we were in the studio mm-hmm. I was like bro if we have time like let's make like a a Nepali country like song and they were like no bro mm-hmm. let's let's work on the actual music that a free vibe and we'll do something on it and ek din se hame itti ke alor basira the ki sab na thakera And I was like, "La Bruto, my little boy, you need to get. Let's like, let's work on that." And then my producer's name's Evan. He came up. He, I was just like, just play like a simple like a country riff on a guitar, and he came up with like the jet. And then as soon as he started playing that, I just like fell into the vibe, and I was like, "Go, that's all it is." 
and <laughs> the actual you don't say you can't hold anybody nothing nothing you don't say you can't it's in a different it's in a different room um <laughs> But uh, the actual lyrics for that song w- was supposed to be But actually is Rani Because my grandmom's name is Kanchige And I was like uh-huh. I can't be singing uh-huh. and sending like in a Like a super like flirty And sending song trying to be all suave And then like name her my thinking grandmother. about the grandmom <laughs> Yeah so I was like F it I'll call it I'll say it and Rani and I was like, you know what? Like everyone calls, everyone says in the music, in it like get myself really country one around. So but I'm gonna call her my queen and so yeah. So I was like, okay, let's call her Rani. And then from then on, like the rest of the song was just like, okay, how can I make this the most and so just like fun, lighthearted, but just like and so stay on the theme. And this entire song was written so quickly and uh, yeah. I think like it wouldn't have been possible with any other team and it wouldn't have been possible in any other location. And uh, yeah, I'm just really proud to have, have made it. And I love like how that song and the lyrics is so you, okay? Because it says like, what's in your Texas? Because you were like, at that yeah, exactly, time, right? exactly. I like, yeah, exactly. Like, it's got that Western, like, Timmy Zateo, Tiago vibe, and but then like the roots of like Nepal and Tony. So Texas, go on, I'm a team, bro, and I got my all that. Bro. I was like, yeah, because I really wanted to like, well, I was like, okay, I've lived in Texas for so many years. I'm from Kathmandu, Unseni. And then when we were talking, we like, we came up with the Kathmandu Cowboy. I was like, okay, that's the name of the song. And from then on, we were just like, okay, how can we develop this like song into song into what it is? Um, yeah, hopefully it does well, man. I feel like I've put in so it, much. It, uh, it will. It I have will. so many hopes sure. writing on this song. Hopefully people enjoy it. Like, like I just want people to be like, oh, this song's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't think anyone's gonna be playing at their like wedding or anything. But if people mm-hmm. are just like, yeah, this song is a bop, Unseni, like that's enough for me. Yeah. But you know, you know what? Yeah. Like in your in your first album, ne, there's like so many different varieties of song. Okay? I, I can I can listen to one while driving. I can listen to one while dancing, Unseni, yeah. and like. Obviously, not people are gonna play it in the wedding, but it it just like reminds me. Okay, if I had to do like a wedding dance, it might be on like mystery Oz. Wait, a mystic waltz. Mystic waltz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're good, bro. You're good. You're good. Yeah, you're good. But damn, bro, yeah. that song, man. I swear, cause like, yo, euta album There's so much variety. Okay? Yeah, it's got everything. Okay? And so like. Whenever you're thinking, like you're telling us that you're gonna put out more songs, like yeah, exciting, yeah. Could I get? Yeah, I think so. The reason I think the song sounds so different is because they were all written in such different parts of my life. Okay? Mm-hmm. So, for example, mm-hmm. like Hizuaza, my song Hizuaza, the Hizuaza Aligati Talamada, that part I wrote in 2016. Yes. Okay? When I, like, that was oh. like a different part of my life. When I, no responsibilities, it kind of shows. Beauty that Kotsu, that part, that song I wrote during lockdown and sitting when it was a little bit more, um, the world was a little bit more uncertain, a little bit more somber. Um, Mystic Waltz, for example, we wrote in the studio, like a lot of songs actually we wrote after we got to the studio, um, Mystic Waltz being one of them. Like, it's funny you bring Mystic Waltz up, kid. Like, that song was both the easiest and the hardest song I've ever had to write, kid. Because I had that initial, like, riff on my guitar for the longest time okay? and um not here. <laughs> yeah london man point on so i did sorry <laughs> no worries no worries. i was just say um but that song say for the longest time i just had that riff okay? and i didn't know what to do with it okay? like it felt such like i was so blocked but as soon as we started writing the first words and then the rest of the song just it literally we sat down me and my producer chuck and the song came about in like one day like not not even one day in one hour it was done from start to finish okay so like initially it took days for me to even get the first like sing me a song but as soon as we had that part everything else came so easily okay so yeah i feel like um in a certain way i feel like i have so much to live up to because 
like all these songs that have had so much help on um like i've they've like set the benchmark for people but also for me in terms of the kind of music i want to produce um so it is a little bit scary to be like making new songs because you're always like oh but it needs to at least at least be as good as if not better than my last songs but i think i'm also learning to just live with the fact that like at some point i'll put out a song that's shit and i'll never get to the good like i'll i'll I never get to the amazing songs if I don't put out my shit songs at some point. And so, like, it'll never all just be good. Like, you'll have to, you'll have to take the sh- the good with the bad. And so, I think that's like something that I'm becoming more uh, okay with. But I'm not. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, from this conversation, what I do uh, pick up from you as an artist is, um, I don't know. I think um, you're really like. Sounds a little cliche, but like live live in the moment. Because I don't think uh, stuff like that is possible. Okay? Because uh, like you were talking about la- la- lavender lemonade, me and how yeah. you wanted to capture that moment. Yeah. Like I don't write songs in anything any, any, or anything, but like the journal I kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. try to you know like put in the emotion I feel on paper. Yeah. And I think that is only possible when you actually, you know, like not give a shit about what is happening, but just like be in that moment and just like feel it. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one thing that I have going on for me is uh, to be completely frank, Kunsani, is that I'm not really like motivated by, um, oh, I want to like do this many shows or I want to get mm. this many views or I want to like all I'm. All I want to do, I just want to do cool, cool things, okay? Like, I just want to do cool and interesting things. And so, like, I just want to make songs that people can relate to, that people enjoy, that people mm-hmm. listen to. And I just want to have experiences that I'm like, oh, like, when I look back, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And so I think yeah. that does lend itself a little bit to the music where it's not motivated, like, financially or it's not motivated mm-hmm. by, like, Oh, and so you're like I want to perform this song in front of this many people. So I think like that's like one thing that I've recognized that like I'm driven by is just like I just want to make cool music and do cool things. Yeah. Nice. Yes, to that, brother. Yes, and this. Yeah, bro. Cool, that's like been my cool podcast motto for the past year is just like do cool things. And so you, mm-hmm. even if it's for free even if you have to do it for free just if it's worth if it's the experience then do it because right like for talking going back to the say mary's good gig like i was a charity show so i did it for free but before that i've been saying no to a bunch of like restaurants and stuff because i was just like it's not like i'm it's, it doesn't add that much value to my to my life and it's not like an experience that i'm like oh wow this is going to be something really cool but when something comes yeah. about that you're like okay i know this is going to be like pretty cool i think it's just worth worth exploring mm. yeah nice. yeah that's nice i think we had a very wonderful wholesome conversation thank you yeah so no i had a really great time us. thank you so much for having me so I think we will be linking all your uh, social media handles and everything in the description below. And also for all our listeners and viewers, do not forget to subscribe to us. And we are also present on other platforms like Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. So please make sure you follow us as well. And obviously smash that know. like button. Have a... Yes, sir. Turn on the I think bell it... icon. Get and... it? I think the you bell should icon. do our. Uh... You should do our exit. Oh. Hey, I right. think you would do it better than us. So. All right. Okay, so guys. <laughs> wait, 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 let me do it. Eh? What's up, guys? You had a good time. And now it's time to subscribe. Um, smash that like button. Um, click on the bell icon. And stay tuned for the next episode. Ooh. Hey. Damn. Right. I'll send an invoice to Bully over. I'm both. Thank you so much and we will see you guys in the next one. Bye.